Hello, and welcome to Military Images Live. This is Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images. We are a quarterly magazine that uh, is celebrating our 40th year. Uh, we specialize in uh, showcasing, interpreting, and preserving Civil War portrait photography. If you are a collector, if you are someone who has an active interest in the Civil War, is interested in the human side of the Civil War, of uh, material goods, uh, images in particular, then uh, Military Images has been doing the kind of stuff that you've been interested in uh, for a while now. So I want to welcome everyone tonight, and uh, we'll give a minute or so for folks to start coming online. And um, while that's happening, I'll talk a little bit about an announcement uh, that I want to make. We have a new uh, senior editor who is joining Military Images, and he is Perry Froney. Um, you may know him uh, from this ad, but you probably know him from many years of dealing in the business of antique uh, militaria, uh, especially photography. Uh, Perry has been uh, a stabilizing and powerful force among dealers for years. He has also had an intense interest in uh, fake photography, that is reproductions that have been made and passed off as real images. Uh, Perry's been writing about the subject for years and um, I'm also pleased to announce that Perry is going to begin a column in the magazine. And our goal here is to share, uh, Perry's gonna share information that really gets him, uh, uh, gets his knowledge out to a broader audience, to all of you. So no matter where you are uh, along the spectrum, if you are a beginning collector, if you are someone who's been involved in the, for collecting and dealing in a long time for a long time, um, Perry is going to have news and information that is going to be helpful to you. So, uh, welcome to Perry, the newest senior editor from Military Images. So, I see you folks are beginning to come on, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I, uh, uh, for those of you who know, the issue, the most recent issue, came out about a month ago. And um, as I was thinking back uh, over the issue, and now I'm preparing for the next issue, but looking back, uh, I am struck by one uh, story that, um, that appeared, and it was a story that I wrote. Um, and it was one that I felt compelled to write. Uh, it's about uh, a... Navy Union sailor, and um, his name is Abner Stover. And um, uh, I was at the Dalton, Georgia show back in February, and I uh, met Ben Greenbaum, and he shared with me uh, an amazing collection of artifacts, which includes uh, Stover's two swords that Stover uh, carried with him, and um, uh, his journal which was uh, a number of pages and documented his journey uh, during the war, specifically his service with the Navy. Although he started out in the Army, in the infantry, he goes on and he joins the Navy, and he happens to be off the coast of Savannah uh, in the summer of 1864. I was really compelled uh, by his story, partly because the diary was so fantastic. Uh, and all of that, by the way, uh, the sword, there's photographs, uh, and um, the diary are now owned by Herman Kinder. Uh, the, uh, all, all of this really inspired me. It also reminded me that I had written about uh, one of the sailors that Ensign Stover came in contact with during this event, the capture of the ship that he was on uh, in Savannah. So I thought I'd do something a little different tonight. Uh, I thought I would go ahead and do a reading of this story. And um, uh, it's uh, a few chapters, and I'm just going to read you the story. So uh, if you want to listen to this uh, at any time, at some point in the future, you'll have it. Um, it's something like uh, the military images version of an audio book. Not quite as long. This is an audio story. So I'm going to read the story chapter by chapter, and um, uh, let me know what you think. So here, here we go. 
Abner Stover stood atop Roper Hospital and took in his first panoramic view of Charleston on an August evening in 1864. Freshly bathed and satiated after a splendid soup dinner, he gazed from the heights of the majestic three-story building and glimpsed the activity on the surrounding streets, the Inner Harbor Batteries, and distant Fort Sumter. These landmarks paled in comparison to the sight of Union warships dotting the edge of the harbor. The iron monsters menaced the rebel city, steam pouring from their stacks, and the stars and stripes fluttering in the hot summer breeze. Quote, it looks good to see our gunboats again, he confided in his journal. Stover knew these Navy vessels firsthand, for he served as an ensign in the South Atlantic blockading squadron. That is, until Confederate sailors raided his ship, made him a prisoner of war, and launched him on an odyssey that turned his world upside down. Two Augusts earlier, he had stood in the ranks of the newly organized 35th Massachusetts Infantry. Though Stover and his younger brother, Martin, had enlisted for a three-year term, they left the regiment before the end of 1862 under different circumstances. Martin suffered a wound at Antietam that ended with a disability discharge. Stover, detailed in the commissary, left about the same time when the War Department approved him to be examined for an ensign ship in the Navy, which sorely needed officers to man its rapidly expanding fleet. Stover passed. He had been a sailor in peacetime and received a commission as an acting ensign before Christmas. Meanwhile, a small gunboat too soon to loom large in Stover's life near the end of a long stint of active operations, the Water Witch. The Woodhold sidewheeler had joined the vanguard of vessels in the Gulf of Mexico and reconnoitered the lower Mississippi River in Louisiana during the uncertain early months of the rebellion. The vessel probed waterways and distinguished itself in minor actions against enemy warships before it joined the squadron in the Atlantic Ocean. In early 1863, the Water Witch arrived in New York Harbor for much needed repairs. Stover joined the vessel in March and left with his crewmates in June for the South Carolina coast. Chapter one, all quiet along the Ogeechee. The water which checked in at Port Royal, the Union base of operations located between Charleston and Savannah on June 14th. After a brief stay, the ship slipped into a quiet routine along the blockade, while the great armies of blue and gray struggled for supremacy at Vicksburg and Gettysburg. While the fates of tens of thousands of blue and gray soldiers were decided on these faraway fronts, Stover and his mates absorbed the natural beauty of the sea islands. Fishing, shooting birds, and inland excursions to hunt deer, hogs, and other game became the order of the day. Along inland waterways and on islands named Raccoon, Warsaw, and Ossabaw, they often struck out in their small boat, the Flirt, and returned to the Water Witch with a bounty of food. The occasional alligator, rattlesnake, and shark sparked minor disturbances. These experiences led Stover to note in his diary one day, all quiet along the Ogeechee, a wordplay combining the sardonic phrase uttered by Union soldiers along the Potomac River and the twisted waterway that flowed through Georgia and emptied into the ocean at Ossabaw Island. The war brought Stover and his comrades back to reality every so often. They chased Union deserters, took in renegade rebels, and provided safe haven to runaway slaves. Encounters with other blockade vessels prompted friendly visits and exchanges of news and information. On one occasion, the crew dragged the waters for an anchor lost by another gunboat. The closest Stover came to hostile fire during this period occurred in connection to the Battle of Alusty. In early February 1864, the water which joined other warships along the Florida coast outside Jacksonville in support of the Union Army's invasion of the state. On February 9th, Stover and others landed at Mayport along the St. John's River. They found the once thriving mill town lying in ruins, its white inhabitants having fled. 
Two weeks later, and a dozen miles closer to Jacksonville, Stover led a 10-man reconnaissance in search of enemy troops along the St. John's River near Yellow Bluff. They returned empty-handed. By March, they resumed their peaceful existence in and about the Sea Islands. Stover's journal entry for May 31st, 1864, illustrated the life of ease enjoyed by the crew. Quote, nothing of importance occurred. Chapter two, Paylot's daring attack. Unbeknownst to Stover, that same day, an event with momentous implications for the water which unfolded less than 20 miles away in Savannah. Confederate Naval Command ordered an expedition to capture the water witch. The man selected to lead the force, Lieutenant Thomas P. Pellot, an 1857 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, had resigned in 1861 to follow his home state of South Carolina into the Confederacy. A day later, the Confederate steamer Firefly towed seven boats along with Pellot and his detachment of 131 men from Fort Jackson in the defenses of Savannah a few miles to the Isle of Hope. Here, the steamer separated from the boats, leaving Paylot and his men to move within striking range of the Water Witch, which was understood to lay off nearby Ossaba Sound. Paylot brimmed with optimism about his chances. Quote, the men are all cheerful and anxious for a brush, he stated that day, and added, our organization is excellent and I'm confident of victory. Paylot prepared for victory by bringing along an experienced pilot, Moses Dallas, to bring the water witch back to Savannah. Quote, he is a colored pilot and considered the best inland pilot on the coast, boasted one officer. But the water witch had disappeared. That afternoon, Paylot learned, an observer watched the gunboat steaming south. He reported the news to Savannah and dispatched scouting parties to nearby islands in search of the vessel. Paylot soon discovered the water witch and struck out the following evening to the surprise. Chapter three, cutlasses and revolvers at close range. During the wee hours of June 3rd, Paylot and his fleet of small boats rode through pitch black and stormy night towards the unsuspecting crew of the water witch. One of Paylot's subordinates, midshipman Hubbard Minor, recounted, Quote, when within 300 yards, all seemed to be asking God, as I know I was, to prosper our undertaking, to shield us from harm, and to make us do our duty. The men continued on to the rumble of thunder and the rhythmic slapping of oars against the water until a voice hailed them from the water witch. Miner recalled that pilot Dallas shouted, quote, runaway Negroes followed instantly by Lieutenant Paylot's cry, quote, we are rebels, give way, boys. On the water witch, eyewitnesses recall different words. One man, an escaped slave who later jumped overboard to escape capture, heard, quote, who the hell are you hailing? The officer on watch who answered the call, acting master's mate Eugene D.W. Parsons stated, he hailed the rebels twice. His first call was met by silence, and the second by a rush and a yell. Parsons sounded the alarm by turning the ship's rattle, its ear splitting rat-a-tat-tat-tat, shattering the night like a volley of muskets. The sound shocked Stover from his slumber. Quote, I jumped out of my berth, pulled on my pants, caught my pistol, and ran on deck, he remembered. He entered into a scene of chaos as the rebels had cut through protective netting along the port and starboard sides and had begun to climb aboard. Somewhere in the dark, just ahead of Stover, a fellow officer confronted the oncoming attackers. He was Paymaster Luther G. Billings, regarded by Stover as a kind and generous soul who abhorred mean and selfish behavior. Now, he fought like a madman with a pair of pistols. One of the first foemen he encountered swung a cutlass and struck one of his handguns. Billings grabbed him, pressed a revolver against his side, pulled the trigger, and watched the man collapse on the ground face up. Stover named the dead man as Paylot, the first Confederate to board and the first to fall with a bullet to his heart. 
About this time, the commander of the Water Witch barked out orders to cut the anchor chain and power up the engine and for all hands on deck. He was Austin Pendergrast, the nephew of a Commodore and a career Navy officer from Kentucky who had overlapped with Paylot at the Academy. Pendergast's last command, the Congress, ended with the vessel's fiery death at the hands of the ironclad Virginia in the spring of 1862 and Pendergast's capture. After his release and return to duty, Pendergast vowed he would never again be taken prisoner. With Paylot out of the picture, command devolved upon Lieutenant Joseph Price, a native North Carolinian who, like Stover, had, st had started the war in the infantry before he had joined the Navy. Midshipman Minor became executive officer. Back on deck, Stover joined Billings in the escalating fray, their shouts and yells mixed with boots pounding along the planks in all directions as flashes of lightning and revolvers revealed the glint of cutlass blades and muted figures moving this way and that. Stover pulled up alongside the rail and pumped two shots into the first boat and watched it drop astern, then squeezed off two more rounds at rebels swarming over the port side. They fell back, albeit in temporary confusion. As Stover's revolver recoiled, Lieutenant Price grabbed him violently. The rebel commander fired point blank at Stover's chest. The bullet somehow missed the mark. Stover returned the compliment and sent a ball just above Price's lower ribs, but it glanced off the clasp of a belt or some other item without inflicting a death blow. Undeterred, Price drew up his cocked revolver and placed the muzzle against Stover's breast. Before Price pulled the trigger, Stover wrapped his fingers of one hand around the barrel and threw the gun clear of danger. Then, with his other hand, he fired his own revolver and sent a lead slug into the fleshy part of Price's leg. Out of bullets, Stover converted his gun into a cudgel, walloped Price on the head, and threw him to the deck near one of the howitzers. Stover jumped on top of him, but Price soon gained the advantage in what became a wrestling match. Stover extricated himself from the grip and turned Price under. Then he grabbed the commander's own revolver and pushed the barrel hard against Price's throat and began to crush the windpipe. Price pushed back with all he had and broke the hold. Stover scrambled for his revolver in the darkness and, after he failed to find it, turned to the nearby howitzer and reached for a metal compressor to beat the life out of Price. As he leaned over Price, two rebels came to their commander's aid. One landed a heavy blow with a thick, dull blade on Stover's right shoulder. Then, as Stover instinctively rose up to counter the new threat, a sharp saber blade sliced into his head above the left eye. Four more blows, fast and furious, cutting into Stover's head like a bullock at slaughter. Stover collapsed, unconscious. Chapter four, pusillanimous cowards. Quote, how long I laid, I am unable to tell. But when I came to, it was by a feeling that someone hit my head with the foot, Stover recalled. As the fog cleared from his brain, he realized he had been brought to the captain's cabin and recognized Pendergrass lying on his back with a deep gash in his forehead. Stover also learned a terrible truth that the water witch had fallen to the Confederates and that, though he and several officers had put up one hell of a fight, others holding higher rank surrendered with little or no resistance. They included master's mate Parsons, who did not have a scratch on him despite being the first to encounter the enemy and the engineers. Stover judged them harshly in his diary, believing that the four engineering officers armed with revolvers could easily have defended the machinery. Stover was also impressed with the performance by the crew, who showed little appetite for battle. Stover summed up the uneven response by the crew to the attackers, quote, we surrender a pusillanimous coward. There were a few notable exceptions, among them landsman Jeremiah Sills. This young African-American, according to an officer, quote, is said to have fought most desperately, and this while men who despised him 
cowering near with idle cutlasses in the racks jogging their elbows. Sills died at his post in defense, uh, of, in defense while prejudiced white crewmen who held him contempt for the color of his skin. Sills was not the only black man to die here. On the Confederate side, pilot Moses Dallas suffered a death wound inflected by the revolver of Billings, the fighting paymaster. The loss deprived the victorious Confederates of the man they depended upon to get them home. They navigated the water which towards Savannah with the help of another slave, a man named Ben. The vessel grounded several times before it anchored near Burnside Island at Battery Bulu, part of the city's defenses. Confederates manning the battery rode out to meet the newest gunboat in the defenses of Savannah. Chapter five, fresh fish and bloodhounds. Once secured, the new masters of the water which removed the Federals, stripped the vessel of valuable signal books and other materials and counted casualties. They amounted to 18 Southerners killed and wounded and 14 Northerners. A total of 77 Union sailors were imprisoned in Savannah and the Naval Hospital. Stover landed in the latter place, transported with other wounded by ambulance with their baggage. He noted that every attention was paid us that was possible. Indeed, we fared much better than we had reason to suspect. The limits of better care soon became evident. On June 5th, the rebels transferred Stover and other prisoners to Oglethorpe Barracks, a military post established a few decades earlier. The heat and flies were stifling. Using a broken bottle for a cup, Stover and Paymaster Billings took turns pouring water over each other to keep their bodies and wounds clean. One of their number, acting master Charles W. Buck, procured a pipe and tobacco in an attempt to smoke out the insects. The worst was yet to come. On June 9, Stover boarded a train with others for Camp Oglethorpe in Macon. They marched into the stockade that night, Stover recalled, and, quote, were greeted by the cry of fresh fish, take off that hat, and don't hit him with that cornbread, and all such like expressions. But as soon as the excitement was over a little, we were surrounded by eager questions. And for a long time, we were unable to answer the many questions put to us. We then spread out our bedclothes and lay down under cover of the star-decked cloudless canopy of heaven. He awoke the next morning to his first look at the three-acre compound that housed some 1,300 Union officers. In the days that followed, events occurred that became recurring themes in his diary. Short rations, new arrivals, prisoner escapes, rumors of mistreatment of enlisted men at nearby Andersonville, and health issues. On June 17th, he wrote, quote, all day it seems to be a dream that we can be cooped up, but we are coming to the stern reality of the thing. A few uniquely memorable occasions broke up the steady stream of daily challenges. A chance encounter with an officer from his old regiment, the 35th Massachusetts. His poor performance as a cook, which prompted him to muse in his diary that his girlfriend back home, Emma, quote, would laugh at me and make fun of me. But it is, of course, an experience which will live in my memory as long as I live. A July 4th celebration in which the inmates rallied around a tiny flag smuggled in by one prisoner, followed by songs, speeches, and cheers for President Abraham Lincoln, Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, Sherman, the Union, the Declaration of Independence, and the Stars and Stripes. Writing his will to prevent fights over his few belongings in camp in the event of his demise. On July 17th, Captain Pendergrast arrived from Savannah, finally healed from his wounds and ready to join his subordinate officers and the rest of the prison population. Stover wrote, his good-natured countenance gives us new hope and strengthens us for a little while longer. He added, as long as we are together, we shall feel much better. The strength gleaned from these bonds of friendship supported Stover during the next stage of his prisoner of war ordeal, Charleston. On July 27th at midnight, Stover and others left Camp Oglethorpe for Charleston by rail. Two days later, he and five other officers leapt from the train, took cover in bushes, and set out for the coast, where they hoped to hail a blockade ship. They might have made it, but Confederate bloodhounds brought them to bay, 
less than 24 hours after the escape. Back in Confederate custody, the renegades resumed the trip and arrived in Charleston on the last day of July. There, Stover and his comrades took up residence in the county jailhouse for two weeks of exposure to brutally hot sun on bare, filthy ground with nothing but a thin piece of duck cloth for protection. Meager rations and no cooking utensils added to the suffering. Quote, I think it was rather rough treatment for prisoners of war, Stover has observed. Chapter six, human shields and Southern chivalry. Perhaps the biggest threat to Stover's survival came not from the grounds of the county jail, but from above in the form of an incessant artillery barrage. In this case, friendly fire for the shells that hummed overhead from morning till night roared from the muzzles of cannon on federal gunboats and Union occupied island batteries. The shelling had intensified in recent weeks due to a grim game of tit for tat brinkmanship in which soldiers became pawns. A month before Stover and his mates had arrived, the general in charge of the Confederate military department that included Charleston, Samuel Jones, placed 50 federal officers in the line of Union fire in an effort to end the shelling. The incensed Union commander, Major General John G. Foster, retaliated by placing 50 Southern officers in the path of Confederate fire. In effect, the men became human shields. About the time Stover stepped foot in the county jail, the situation escalated when the Confederates placed 600 more Union officers in harm's way. Foster later struck back with 600 Confederates before both sides backed down. Stover and the captive Waterwitch officers did not officially number among the 600. They, however, may be considered human shields as the county jail was located within range of the Union guns. Roper Hospital, where Stover was moved on August 13th, proved as dangerous as the jail. He could clearly see Union gunboats and batteries pounding away at the city from the rooftop of the hospital. Two weeks later, on August 28th, one of the shells, a hundred pounder, burst over one end of the facility and sent a 15 pound fragment crashing into an adjacent workhouse where a number of prisoners were housed. No one suffered an injury. Stover noted, quote, that is a little too close when we have no means to protect ourselves, but that is a treatment of the Southern chivalry towards her prisoners of war. The shelling continued day after day. Though Stover had his share of close calls, he survived the bombardment and his imprisonment. On September 30th, 1864, he boarded a train for the North to be formally exchanged. The trip lasted three weeks, including a stay at Libby Prison in Richmond. At 4 a.m. on October 17th, Stover marched from Libby Prison to a truce boat headed to the final leg of his journey out of captivity. In his final diary entry, Stover reflected, quote, oh, what joy. Shall I ever forget? No, I guess not. Chapter 7, Epilogue. Four days later, Stover arrived in Washington, D.C. His stint as a prisoner of war lasted about four months. The Navy furloughed him for the holidays, and he made a beeline to Brooklyn, where he wed his girlfriend, Emma, on December 6th. A few weeks later, they celebrated their first Christmas as a married couple. Some 800 miles south, Major General Sherman and his army observed the Holy Day in Savannah, which they entered as victors on December 21st. Sherman famously presented the city as a Christmas gift to President Lincoln. The gift did not include the water witch, for Confederate forces had burned the gunboat to prevent it from falling into federal hands. The Union Navy launched a court of inquiry to investigate the capture of the Water Witch. Rear Admiral Lewis M. Goldsboro provided over, presided over the assembly, which took Lieutenant Commander Pendergrast to task for not taking enough precautions to ensure the vessel's safety. The court reasoned that if Pendergrast had thrown out a picket boat managed by a couple of sailors and an officer with a proper signal lantern, the enemy might have detected, might have been detected earlier, and precious minutes might have been saved to organize a successful defense. 
The court criticized acting master Mate Parsons for exhibiting poor ability and raised serious questions about the conduct of the chief engineer. Navy brass hauled Pendergrass before a court's marshal and found him guilty of culpable inefficiency in discharge of duty. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells approved his suspension from duty for two years on half pay and loss of rank during this time. Pendergrass served his sentence and returned to duty with the South Pacific Squadron. He died in 1874 on active duty with the rank of full commander. Paymaster Billings, the fighting paymaster, went on to a long Navy career, buoyed by his valorous acts in defense of the Water Witch. He retired from the Navy in 1898 as a rear admiral and was recalled to duty during the First World War as a purchasing offer for the purchasing officer for the Eastern Division in Baltimore. He died at age 78 in 1920 and was buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery. Lieutenant Joseph Price, who took charge of Confederate forces after Paymaster Billings shot and killed Lieutenant Paylot, continued his Navy service in North Carolina as Confederates, uh, as, pardon me, as commander of the ironclad ram Noose. In March 1865, Confederates burned the vessel to keep it out of hands of the advancing Union forces. Price settled in Wilmington, North Carolina after the war and went on to become the city's harbor master. He died in 1895 at age 59. Midshipman Miner, who advanced to executive officer and second in command to Lieutenant Price, survived a serious gunshot wound to the leg during the combat on the Water Witch. Miner remained in Savannah and fled upon the arrival of Sherman's army. He landed in Richmond only to be forced to evacuate and Grant's forces to the city in April 1865. Miner made his way back to Savannah and married a young woman with whom he had fallen in love during his time there. He died of an unknown cause at age 29 in 1874. The Navy recalled Stover to duty on January 3rd, 1865, ordered to the frigate Savannah, which he may have found amusing considering his experience Officials soon detached him to the sleek gunboat Preston, a British-built blockade runner recently captured by Union forces along the North Carolina coast. Plagued by diarrhea and lung trouble attributed to his time as a prisoner of war, he was granted a leave of absence in August 1865 and an honorable discharge before the end of the year. In 1868, a, di a doctor diagnosed him with consumption and he succumbed to its effects in February 1869 at age 33. Emma and their two-year-old son survived. Later that year, Emma received a package from Georgia. It contained a sword carried by her late husband and returned by a Confederate veteran. He was William W. Carnes, a U.S. Naval Academy cadet who had resigned to become an artillery captain in his native Tennessee. He transferred to the Navy's Savannah Station late in the war, at which time he stated he had been given the sword by an officer under his command who had participated in the Water Witch Affair. Carnes recalled that the officer, quote, called my attention to the name on the blade and requested me to keep it and make such disposition of it as I thought best. Carnes forgot about the sword until he rediscovered it during a move in the winter of 1868-1869, during which time Stover lay in the throes of his final illness. Carnes advertised his desire to return the sword to its rightful owner in the New York Tribune. One of Emma's friends noticed the ad and alerted her about it. Though Emma remarried in 1886, she likely kept the sword in her possession and passed it to her son before she died in the 1910s. Engraved on the blade of the sword are words that are a tribute to Stover's service and sacrifice. Quote, for the old flag. That concludes our story for this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. And uh, we will see you on the next episode of Military Images Live. Have a great night. Bye now.